Good morning, everyone. Um, it being 9 a.m. on Monday, um, February 1st, uh, I'll call the um, hearing of the Senate Ways and Means Committee to order. Uh, and we'll begin uh, with the required right to know uh, declaration. I'm Senator Bob Guider from District 2. Today, we're holding a meeting of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Before we get started, uh, the following announcement is relevant. Uh, so that we're in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. <clears throat> In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that one, we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We're utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via telephone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We've provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We're providing a mechanism for the public to alert the body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remotesenate at leg.state.nh.us. That's R-E-M-O-T-E-S-E-N-A-T-E, -E -E, all one word, at leg state.nh.us or call 603-271-6931. That's 271-6931. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where you are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I'll call the roll now. Senator D'Alessandro. I'm Senator D'Alessandro. I'm in Manchester. I'm in my home and I'm all alone. Senator Daniels. Senator Gary Daniels. I'm at my home in Milford and I am alone. Senator Hennessy. Good morning, Aaron Hennessy. I am at home in Littleton. I am alone in the room. Senator Rosenwald. Good morning, Cindy Rosenwald from Nashua. I'm in my home and I'm alone. Yes, and I'm Senator Bob Guida at my home in Warren. Um, my grandson and daughter are upstairs and may occasionally transit this room, but at this time I'm alone. Uh, for the sake of process clarity, this being our first omnibus bill hearing on Senate Bill 13, we're going to allow the prime sponsors to speak first, and then we will then deal with uh, each individual section of the bill as far as uh, those wishing to testify. We will, of course, allow uh, senators or representatives who wish to testify to do so uh, immediately after the prime sponsors, uh, and then we'll go in order of the respective sections of Senate Bill 13. Does anyone have a question about this process? Hearing none, I'll recognize the prime sponsor of Senate Bill 13, of Senate President Chuck Morse. Senator Morse, you should be all set. Okay, are you muted, sir? Okay, this is the third time a charm? It is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I am Senator Chuck Morse. I represent Senate District 22, which includes the towns of Salem, Atkinson, Blastow, and Pelham. This morning, I am pleased to introduce Senate Bill 13, adopting omnibus legislation on state taxes and fees. The omnibus bill has four parts. Part one, relative to the rates of business profits tax and the business enterprise tax. It's sponsored by myself, but I do want to add that this was Speaker Hinch's legislation 
um, that after his passing, um, the House had asked us to look at a few bills, and this was one of them. Um, part two, relative to the exemptions for the tax on interest and dividends, also sponsored by myself. Part three, relative to the property tax exemption for educational organizations sponsored by Senator Gray. And part four, relative to the authority of the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification to establish fees sponsored by, by Senator Guida. I'll let Senator Gray and Senator Guida speak to their parts and I'll focus on my two. First on part one, it reduces the BPT from 7.7% to 7.5% and the BET from 0.6% to 0.5%. The reduction is important because we know our Main Street businesses are struggling right now due to the pandemic and Senate Bill 13 will help. Family owned businesses that have existed for generations are being stretched to the breaking point due to no fault of their own. We need to do all that we can to help them survive and, re and rebuild as we move forward. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel for this pandemic, but we are not quite there yet. Senate Bill 13 would provide modest relief for Main Street businesses trying their best to make ends meet. Most importantly, this bill is about jobs. It will help those small businesses keep our friends and neighbors employed. And as the pandemic ends, rebuild a stronger New Hampshire. Part two is a pretty straight, is pretty straightforward. It doubles the current exemption from 1200 to 2400 for those who are 65 or older or blind or disabled, unable to work and are not yet 65. On those last two points, being unable to work or, not, or being not yet 65, the bill will give some relief to those who have other circumstances in lives that deserve consideration, which is why these exemptions were put in the first place. Increasing the exemption for those who are 65 and over will make it easier for those near retirement to stay in the state rather than moving somewhere else like Florida. Demographic projections show that by 2030, almost one third of New Hampshire citizens will be above the age of 65. While we wanna do everything that we can to encourage young families to move and stay in New Hampshire, taking this step will make sure that we are not losing our talented older workforce to other states. In addition, these exemption levels have not kept up with inflation. For the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the exemption was $1,200 in 1981, the last time these exemptions were modified. Adjusting properly, those exemptions would be over 3,500, 3,400 today. This bill does not get us all the way there, but it helps and creates a good start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will take any questions. Thank you, uh, President Morris. Uh, any questions from members of the committee? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Morris. Um, I'm looking also um, as regards part one of your bill at the presentation we got last week from the Department of Revenue Administration. And I was hoping you could tell us more about the small businesses that, that this section will be helping New Hampshire's Main Street businesses. So as I look at their chart uh, on the BPT, 97% of the taxes paid by 4.7% of the filers. So um, we have 3% of the BPT uh, and about 25% of the BET that is paid by smaller businesses. Can you give us more information, please, on where these businesses are, what, what they are that make up 3% of the revenues? I think people that are following me can specifically tell you what businesses they are, but I think we're missing the point in the Senate. The reality of lowering these taxes 
um, when we did originally was to send the message that New Hampshire wanted businesses to stay here in New Hampshire and to look at coming to New Hampshire. And we've been extremely successful in doing that. I mean, whether you're a small business or not, um, if you're a small business paying a business profits tax, like I am, and I have next door neighbors that own sub shops, they're benefiting from the fact that I can give employees more money. Um, that's what's happened in this. And I think what this piece of legislation that Speaker Hinch introduced is trying to do is basically solidify the message um, for the next four years that this is where New Hampshire intends to get to, not put it on some kind of up and down basis. Um, this is where we wanna to get to in our tax rates. Um, I'm sure it would, it's an effective message to be honest with you. Um, we've had growth in business taxes even during the last four years of 4% in New Hampshire. So as this legislation, the document that was sent to us talks about over a cumulative period of time, we may have a $53 million exposure. It never speaks to the fact that we can grow the business taxes in New Hampshire um, at the same time period. So I think that's an important part of what we have to do. We have to stay consistent with this. And I think that's what the speaker was trying to do when he introduced the legislation is no more uh, putting this on some guidelines with some test um, because that's not the message you want to send to businesses. Thank you. Further questions? Senator D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Moss, uh, all right, really, uh, really good to, to hear from you this morning. We know that when we, when we were shown the pyramid by the Department of Revenue Administration, we know that about 80, 80 companies in, in New Hampshire pay the bulk of, of the business profits tax, and they've been doing extremely well. We reduced it from 8.5 to 7.9 to 7.7. .7. We reduced the BET uh, proportionately, and about 50% of the businesses are small businesses, and they have no tax liability at all. So who will, will, be, who will we be helping by, by this legislation? The, the top people are doing extremely well. They, they're prospering. We've done, we've done great work for them in terms of tax reduction. How are we going to help people who have no tax liability? Yes, Senator, I, I, I would agree with you that this opens it up to some businesses more than others. But the reality is we just have to look at what, how wages are growing in the state of New Hampshire to tell it's working. I mean, the fact is we don't need someone to define minimum wage um, to tell me as a businessman that I have to meet whatever the economy is driving it to down here in the Southern tier. It's been significant um, and it's working. And it's because businesses have the ability to give wage increases, um, whether it's a big business or a small business. I mean, I honestly believe what we're not looking at as a state right now is the fact that, you know, these main street businesses, when this economy opens up, um, they need a push. And that push is going to come from the fact that people want to be in New Hampshire, want to be purchasing things. I mean, it's pretty diverse to look at the budget in the state of New Hampshire compared to Massachusetts, where their model is just tax. Um, you know, we're, being, we're very successful right now during the pandemic, and I, I honestly believe we're going to come out of it um, better than most New England states. Um, so I think there's a positive message to send here, and I, I'm sure when I was dealing with Speaker Hinch on this uh, months ago, that's what he was talking about, was that positive message in New Hampshire. Just if I could follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Uh, thank, thank you. I think we've sent that positive message. And over the past decade, we have played around with taxes 35 or 36 times. We've eliminated tax after tax after tax. And I think by reducing the BPT from the 8.5 to the 7.9 to the 7.7, .7, we've really shown uh, our willingness to support business. And I think business, generally speaking, has been supportive of what we have done. And uh, they're, they're pretty pretty uh, happy with what the situation is right now. 
So uh, again, my, 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 my question is, if you're not paying any taxes, how does cutting your taxes help you? Well, on the record, I am paying taxes. Well, that, um, I mean, that's, that's you. I, I'm, I'm just talking, I'm talking I'm, about the broad generalization, not, not you in, in particular. So <laughs> I know you're a good taxpayer, a worthy taxpayer. But I, I think when we made the promise that we were reducing taxes, we made it without putting any triggers in. Um, and we certainly said the message was gonna be, we were going to 7.5 on the BPT and, and on the BET, we were gonna to get to 0.5. Um, that was where we were going. The compromise to get there was putting it in a system that kind of went down and this extends it. Um, then we came along with something else in budgets that put triggers in um, to test it every year. Um, I think that's the wrong message. I, I think these companies that are looking at New Hampshire and doing calculations <coughs> on electric rates and other things, this is just another thing in the model that they can look at that New Hampshire want businesses here. Thank you. Thank Senator you. Hennessy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Morse, for taking my question. Um, when we were going through the period of time where we were unsure of whether the tax triggers were gonna be hit in the fall because of revenues, I heard from several small locally owned businesses on Main Street here in Littleton, um, wondering why we would do this to them. So my question to you is, it might be more of a statement, but it, even though the big companies down South that really don't we don't see up here in the North country pay a lot of the taxes. That doesn't mean that the taxes that small businesses up here in the North country pay are not significant to them. Would you agree with me on that? I would agree. And I, I think the fact is that whether you're employed in the North country or you're employed in the Southern tier, your wages are going up. And I'm sure you heard that um, because we've created this economy in the state of New Hampshire. And, and I think it works. Any further questions from members of the committee? Okay, Senator hearing Daniels. none. Oops, Senator, oh, sorry, Senator, Senator Daniels. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Senator Moss. Uh, we, we have seen uh, a trend when we lower taxes, uh, particularly with our borders, and we'll take uh, things like uh, cigarettes, and we cause more of a a difference between our tax and our neighboring states tax that we tend to draw business from those states over into ours. As we look at uh, uh, the possibility of lowering the business profits tax economically, uh, do you have any kind of projections on what that would do in lowering unemployment in New Hampshire because we would we'd be drawing further business to the state? <laughs> No, I don't have a projection on unemployment, but I guess our goal is to get back down to be the lowest in the nation, 2.3% uh, or wherever we were before the pandemic. So um, I, I think all of these things send that message. Um, listen, when finance starts to meet in April um, with your committee, I think the interesting thing is going to be where the state of New Hampshire stands. Um, you're going to have two times where you're going to see taxes that were paid by businesses. You're gonna have March 15th and April 15th when Senate Finance gets um, a look at it and Ways and Means actually gets a look at what's come into the state of New Hampshire during this time period. I think that that's gonna be a positive sign of how New Hampshire, just like you said, avoided putting taxes in place like cigarettes or anything else, um, liquor, um, you're going to see that we benefited from that during this pandemic um, because people wanted to shop in New Hampshire because of the tax statuses that we have. So I, I think this just goes along with that whole message. And all these big companies that are looking at New Hampshire right now, um, we want. Them, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much, Senator Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any that? Next, we have Senator Gray. Okay. Uh, 
Good morning. Can you hear me now? Morning, Senator Gray. Yes, we can. Welcome. It looks, it looks like it. Uh, my portion of this uh, bill is, uh, I am Senator Gray. I represent uh, uh, Alton, Barnstead, Gilmanton, uh, New Durham, uh, Rochester, Farmington. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, section three of the bill. Uh, and it's uh, a section that was requested by the Assessing Standards Board um, in uh, the RSA 7223. Um, it lists various charitable organizations to fill out a particular form, uh, which assists the assessing standards, uh, the assessing people in uh, doing their work. Uh, educational facilities were not included in that. Um, and uh, we're just trying to correct that. The uh, members have uh, gotten a, a copy uh, of the form um, so that you can see it. Uh, somehow you guys have all disappeared, uh, but uh, I'll continue and uh, listen to you. Um, if uh, you have any questions, there'll be other people that will be testifying on it. Uh, the form is uh, easy, simple to do. Uh, it just uh, provides greater assistance to those people uh, so that they can uh, and do their work. If there are there any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And any questions from members of the committee? Senator D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, Senator Gray, welcome to, welcome to the committee. Senator Gray, who has been... Uh, who has been affected at this point by by the, the fact that their properties were, were evaluated improperly? I don't believe that uh, anyone is alleging that the values of the property have been, uh, uh, that it uh, takes a lot longer. It means that the assessors have to go back and contact the people uh, to get the information, uh, causing them problems. Um, it does open up the um, organization for, for further questions if they don't fill out the form. Um, so again, I believe that this is actually a win-win for both the organizations and the Assessing Standards Board, but there are people uh, who have told me that they've signed up who are much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable than I, Senator. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Senator Gray. Appreciate that. Further questions from the committee? All right, hearing none, uh, I'll relinquish the gavel to the chair. Um, I'm sorry, to Senator D'Alessandro, to the vice chair, so that I can bring in my section of Senate Bill 13. Senator D, you have the chair. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you, Chairman Guida. So uh, for, for testimony, call upon Senator Guida, who, who's handling section, section two, the exemptions for the tax on interest and dividends. Senator Geyer, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And members of the committee, for the record, Bob Geyer, Senator from District 2. Um, uh, I've been working on this bill for well over a year with, with the assistance of uh, uh, the executive director, now executive director of uh, OPLC, uh, Lindsay Courtney. OPLC has been in existence for uh, at least five, probably six years has been really unable to achieve the efficiencies uh, that were uh, the reason for its formation. Uh, that was to standardize the administrative processes for administration and licensing um, and certification, uh, not to actually interfere in any way with the function of the various boards, and I think there are over 60 of them, uh, but to standardize uh, and streamline the licensure and certification processes for businesses and individuals in the state that would make application to operate under any of these licensure provisions. Uh, this section of the bill, uh, it, it addresses the issue of fees uh, and the management of the fee uh, mechanisms by OPLC. Uh, and rather than get into its details, uh, I'll allow uh, the executive director at the appropriate time to uh, to detail the specifics of the bill. It is a lengthy portion uh, of Senate Bill 13, but it is a very necessary one uh, if OPLC is to achieve the efficiencies for which it was conceived. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, any questions for Senator Guida? 
uh, just if I if I might, uh, Senator, we know that that this this uh, organization has undergone uh, a, a number of, of flips uh, recently. We have the consolidation. We have the location at, at one location that's moved to to another location. Will will what you're bringing forward do two things? A make it easier to to get a license. Uh, or, or to, to get a response from, from the entity? And two, will, will there be a, a simplification in how to, how to do this? Because one of the problems that I've heard about is the complexity of, of dealing with the boards. Thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, the answer to both is yes. Uh, I think that'll be proved out uh, rapidly. Uh, as an example of one of the problems we've had uh, with the nursing board, as you know, as the members of the committee know, we've had a, a terrible shortage of LNAs and RNs in the state. Uh, and the process of certifying licensees from out of state uh, was so poorly managed uh, by the nursing board, and uh, they're busy and, and they're volunteers as well, uh, that the governor Sununu had to implement an emergency order that remedied that situation, which is hopefully going to be codified into law. Uh, to enable a much more streamlined process of review and, and, and approval for out-of-state licensees with the necessary qualifications getting licensed in New Hampshire. That's just one example. Uh, so yes, the answer to both your questions would be yes. And, and, uh, and I think that perhaps the executive director would be much better suited to, to specifically talk to the details of that question. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Senator Hennessy has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator um, Gaida, can you, I just reading through this, I didn't see any place where it raised a fee. Could you just confirm that there's no raising of fees in here? I don't see a raising of fees taking place, but I see a standardization of the fee process and an amalgamation of, of the fee structure to support OPLC, okay, from that fee structure. Uh, but again, I think the executive director who actually wrote the language of this of this legislation uh, would be better qualified to speak to that. But uh, I don't believe any fees are being raised at this point. Thank you. For, for the question, Senator? No. Okay. Any, anyone else have a question for, for Senator Guida? Senator Daniels has his hand raised. Senator D'Alessandro. Senator Daniels, please. Thank you. Uh, to, to segue on Senator Hennessy's uh, question, while I don't see anything in there about um, fees being raised, what is the possibility that by taking the amount out of statute and, and allowing it to be raised uh, by rules, uh, what, is a, what do you see as the, the possibility that that would happen? I think it's possible. Um, I think that uh, uh, one of the problems that we have right now is that OPLC's funding mechanism depends on fees raised by the various boards. Uh, I don't believe that the fees would be raised without consultation with the boards and without justification for uh, the bu budgetary necessity to do so to support the functions of OPLC uh, as an entity. So yes, there is the possibility. Follow up. Yes, Senator Dance, go ahead. Uh, be, being that New Hampshire is one of the most licensed states in the country, um, I, guess, I guess my 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 concern would would, would be that uh, we are now taking this out of the hands of the legislature and putting it uh, in into the rules of an agency. Is that any concern of yours? It is always a concern. Uh, the, other, the, the other counter concern uh, is that in managing uh, that's 60 plus agencies uh, to have to come to the legislature every time any one of those, legis any of those agencies or the OPLC budget itself requires a, uh, you know, an increase for some reason uh, that it would be uh, you know, continually bringing this back to the legislature because of the number of agencies involved. Uh, I'm certainly amenable to any suggestions uh, uh, in consultation with the executive director that might uh, that might uh, bring it to statutory requirement uh, to, to address your concerns. But again, the, the cumbersomeness of doing that um, and of getting it through the legislature uh, in the, because of the fact that those fees are used to keep those agencies, those those licensing boards uh, operating effectively and efficiently. 
um, is, is equally, you know, a, a point of, of concern or, or discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Davis. A any further questions for, for Senator Guida? If not, thank you very much, Senator. And, uh, Ava, who's next? So, um, Senator, next would be since all three senators have introduced all four parts of the bill, next would be to prompt anyone, I think it would be to shift the gavel back to Senator Guida, right. Right. and then it would be to ask whoever is interested in testifying to part one to virtually raise their hand at this time, and then we'll go through the parts in that order. Senator Guida. Thank you. I have resumed the chair. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. You're and thank, thank you, Ava. Um, so uh, with respect to part one uh, of the bill, uh, are there any senators or representatives present who have other hearings as well to attend to uh, who would be willing to testify? So Representative Almy has her hand raised. Representative Almy, uh, welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm a bit at a loss because I prepared something to talk about everything except section three. Uh, will you take me three times or <laughs> how do I do this? Uh, I think for the purposes of your time schedule, we would take you on all those and, uh, and then move on to the next person. Thank you so much. That's a great help. Um, since this bill has four distinct parts with very different impacts, it's impossible. Oh, sorry. Uh, I am Representative Susan Almy, Grafton 13 Thank you. of Lebanon. On, and on, I was chair last term of Ways, House Ways and Means, and um, I am still on Ways and Means. On, since this bill has four distinct parts with very different impacts, it's impossible. it was impossible to say whether I was for or against. So I put neutral. Uh, with the idea that that uh, that would include wishing an amendment, which was the old way that people did that. Um, I speak, I'm speaking now for Representative Ames as well, who had uh, put in to testify, um, but felt that that I could handle it on my own. <laughs> um, <laughs> We, we are totally opposed to the further cutting of the state level business taxes in part one. Um, we have no idea yet what March and April are going to bring. They're going to be key months to see whether we get major refund requests and reductions of future estimates or not. Um, um, given the variance that COVID uh, is producing at this point. It may not lose its hold on the economy uh, by or in FY22. Uh, we don't know what market-based sourcing is going to do to our revenues yet, whether we're going to profit or lose by it. Um, we, uh, and we don't know whether you're going to insist on that huge extra gamble of sticking uh, uh, single sales factor on next year, which could have massive effects to the negative or some effects to the positive on our revenues. Um, and we will be back to you about that later as a committee. Um, at the Business and Industry uh, Summit this fall, business CEOs revealed that they are told by their accountants only what their total tax burden is, not whether it's federal or municipal or, uh, or state on, uh, or a bunch of, I'm not sure whether the fees are in that or not, but they just give them a line that says taxes. And they themselves, when pressed by Mr. Roche, uh, said that the tax burdens are composed of different things in different places, and you want to look just at the total, and um, that, that they, it's really not as significant for them as quite a lot of other things. We have heard that, I've heard that for 15 years now, um, that, that the tax burden is somewhere around number nine in 10 of the factors that the businesses look like when they look at when they're thinking of moving. 
Um, we know that the average business pays more in New Hampshire in property taxes than in state business taxes, twice as much more according to the industry-run Council on State Taxation in DC, which has been putting out these documents for, at least I've got them for 15 years. We used to be somewhere around 46% and it's now up above 50%. Um, and we know that the property taxes go up every year and that a lot of it is due to the withdrawal or reduction of state and, and uh, direct of state aid for direct municipal and county subsidies and for the provision of services such as police training, elder and indigent assistance and public health, which is extremely important to us now and our system is lacking, uh, and of fixed public school system costs. Further reduction of our largest state level revenue source, which is paid overwhelmingly by multi-state and multinational corporations that regard New Hampshire's taxes as very low on their list of reasons to operate here, is counterproductive both to our economy and our citizenry. And to Senator D'Alessandro, I'd like to say that a lot more than half of the businesses have no tax liability from our business taxes because an unknowable number of them do not even file. Uh, those triangles, uh, we call them triangles, you call them pyramids, on, on, do not include the people who never filed. Uh, I wanted to add something summarized from, uh, which I summarized from Representative Ames, assertions by supporters of this bill that business tax revenues go up when rates go down are typically backed up only by anecdote or by graphs that display apparent correlations between increased revenues and tax rate reductions. These assertions are not supported by fact-based inquiry. There are multiple variables that need to be carefully examined to test this theory, a theory which has been reviewed in, refuted in many academic studies nationally and in individual states. In our case, variables affecting revenue include repatriation, changes in New Hampshire business activity by Water's Edge commun companies, the multinationals and multi-states, whose taxable activity here is not influenced by marginal changes in our rates, uh, by changes in the timing and scope of mergers and acquisitions, by changes in federal revenue law, most specifically the huge 2017 reform, which returned huge New Hampshire taxable profits, the largest corporations, which we taxed in 18 and 19. Uh, and in our own tax law, substantially modifying available deductions and credits uh, and peaks in troughs in the business cycle and by black swans, such as the COVID pandemic. Last um, a year and a half ago, I was looking at so many black swans that I couldn't figure out which one was going to land and what landed was something none of us had thought about, the COVID. When you lowered uh, the cigarette tax in 2012, we got less revenue. When uh, we raised the rooms and means, meals tax to um, preserve services, including uh, the advertising done by the state to help the, the uh, restaurants and the hotels, after a, a, I think it was a one year total slump due to the great recession, uh, we've been growing 5% a year until COVID hit, on it, which is, are both contrary to the theory. Uh, the next bill that you're going to hear, SB 101, represents a more efficient and cheaper way to help our businesses that are struggling and still having to pay some BPT, the, that 3% at the bottom. Um, Increased, in part two, increased exemptions for the interest and dividends tax would be helpful for the minority of payers that are both elderly and trying to live off income from long-term investments, as well as startup entrepreneurs that are paying themselves or are paid from distributions because that taxes distributions as well. Uh, but with the trajectory of the COVID pandemic and its aftermath, 
still very much uncertain. Losing significant revenue threatens the ability of the state to provide services needed by businesses and by working families to survive. I presume you will be holding on to this bill until you finish your version of the budget when we will have more, but not enough, data on our real revenues for this year and the trends for the next two years. And um, we're just about to be doing specific revenue estimates now. And I know how difficult it's going to be for you as well. I wanna skip part three, but talk about part four, which I now fully support. It comes from a bill we had in the, that we in the house arranged to kill in the ending chaos of last year. No one from the Senate reached out to the house to explain why that bill was introduced and put, uh, and put into a large composite bill without its own hearing when the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification was about to undergo a performance audit, which it itself had requested, which would better inform the badly needed reforms. That performance audit is going to be out in a few months now. Um, and it now includes a financial audit, which we asked for. Um, um, the chairman is on that committee. Uh, both EDNA and Ways and Means in the House objected on that basis to concurrence because we didn't know what was going on. Um, I have since had a long conversation with Lindsay Courtney, the new executive director, and discovered that she's very highly competent and that she had done a thorough analysis of the department that she found herself in and uh, that it is a necessary first step to the reforms that they are doing. I would like to add to Senator Daniels and Hennessy that the current situation of the boards is that some of them are paying more into the system than they, than they uh, should be paying. And others are not paying enough, partly because they are composed of small, uh, lower income professions that do not have enough money to pay more fees, that it would be a burden on them. And for that, and the real problem as far as I'm concerned with handing the fees over to rules is that we need, need um, to stop lapsing and, and we have increased lapsing of these of what was left of those fees to the general fund budget. So um, it is, I think they lapsed $3 million last year, something like that. Um, I know my friends in finance aren't gonna to be too happy about <laughs> saying that, but on, on behalf of the, uh, the um, on committee, commi uh, dedicated fund, Joint Dedicated Fund Committee, which Senator Guida has also been on, and I hope he will stay on, on, on that, that does mean that the fees uh, are being, that are being produced are too much in that area, and they, and they need to, to stop lapsing in order to make that agency uh, fairer in fees. Um, I apologized to Ms. Courtney on about on delaying her bill. And I now just wanted to apologize to the chair who put that bill in uh, for that delay. And I hope it will stay in the final version of SB 13. Thank you. I hope that was short enough. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Almy. Uh, no apology necessary, but accepted. Uh, victim of COVID again. Um, uh, are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, the next hand we have raised is Greg Moore for part one of the bill. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Greg, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, for, 
Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. For the record, my name is Greg Moore. I am the state director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire, I'm testifying in support of part one. My testimony will be fairly similar to House Bill 10, which was uh, brought in last Thursday at House Ways and Means. This legislation, we believe, uh, continues a very positive trend that began in the 2015 budget uh, the, towards making the state more competitive. And I think we see the fruits of that, not just in terms of, uh, not just in terms of, of overall uh, tax revenue, and which I know is a purview with this committee, but an important component of that is the impact it's had economically on the state of New Hampshire. So to put it in perspective, since we began uh, the, the uh, tax relief that began with that 2015 budget, the state of New Hampshire has added roughly 34,000 uh, more people working up until the beginning of the pandemic. That's, uh, that's a number that's roughly the size of the town of Derry, of people who weren't working in the state, but now are. What, what's more notable is, while we've seen states like Vermont actually see their unemployment rate drop below that of New Hampshire, uh, the reason for that is because they have a shrinking workforce. Uh, the state of Vermont and the state of Maine had shrinking workforces, meaning the number of actual people in the workforce was declining. Over that same period of time, New Hampshire's workforce actually grew by 32,000. Moreover, the state of New Hampshire also had uh, the highest per capita inbound migration of any state in the Northeast. So was, I don't think there's any doubt that our, our economy was booming uh, prior to the COVID pandemic and has the opportunity to continue to, to do that. And that's so we believe that, that the policy has been beneficial. We believe that, that it's made the state more competitive. And we believe that that, in addition to a number of other factors, has helped and transformed the life of many people and given give many people an opportunity for a good job with good wages. So we really think that, that continuing this policy is a positive step. The second reason why we uh, strongly support this legislation is because the last legislature, through a couple pieces of legislation, uh, including the, the budget House Bills 3 and 4, as well as Senate Bill 190, made changes to tax policy that, at least based upon the surplus statement uh, that was introduced with the budget, increased business taxes across the state of New Hampshire by 41 and a quarter million dollars just this fiscal year alone. Uh, in fact, I remember the chair of this committee indicating that the, the proposed changes relative to conformity with the 2017 tax bill at the federal level might bring in as much as $100 million a year. Uh, he's, and I'm not sure if he include, was including the changes to global investment low tax income with that or whether he was speaking ex exclusively about conformity. And frankly, we don't necessarily have a problem with those changes. Uh, those changes actually broaden the base here in New Hampshire of our business tax uh, business taxes. And we believe in the policy of broadening base and lowering rates. Well, we got the broadening the base part in the last legislature. This is the lowering rates to commensurately reduce business taxes to pick up the changes that were made in the last legislature. So we think that this is a natural follow along for that. And then finally, uh, just noting the nature of the tax changes in, in this piece of legislation versus some of the earlier rounds of business tax reduction in, uh, in the 2015 and 2017 budgets. This, this round is, is particularly focused on the business enterprise tax, which is a tax, as, as you know, is really impacts small businesses. The re reduction in the business profits tax is only two and a half percent. However, the reduction in, in this legislation of the business enterprise tax is almost 17%. So this is a tax that seems targeted, this tax relief that seems targeted towards the smaller businesses in the state of New Hampshire. And I think, I, I think that's exactly what we need right at this time. Uh, and uh, I look forward to answering any questions from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Senator Rosenbaum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Greg, nice to see you. Um, a 17% decrease sounds like a big number. It's really a 0.1% decrease. Um, it's, it's always odd to take percentages of percentages because you're working with small numbers. Do you, um, but my question is, do you know what the average uh, decrease will be for a New Hampshire business in that 0.1 percentage point decrease in the BEC? Uh, I, I don't know that I've seen any specifics from DRA, 
uh, as I know that that the, the now now commissioner uh, over at Administrative Services did a, an analysis in uh, 2015, uh, looking at this issue. One of the things that he found was that uh, while we talk about the number of businesses overall in the state of New Hampshire, a number of these small businesses are really just just shell corporate shell companies um, and have no employees. So it, so one of the things he found is that the the number of, of payers goes up substantially once you reduce the number of these, these smaller shell, uh, frequently LLCs. And, and the problem is, is again, big numbers, small numbers, as you point out, Senator, uh, is that if you, once you sort of strain out, out, you can start to see an impact magnified, but I have not seen any data from DRA. I would, uh, I would encourage you to perhaps reach out to the commissioner of revenue administration. He could probably offer much better data that, than, I, than any estimate I would potentially offer. Thank you. Could I follow up, please, Mr. Chairman? Follow up, please. Thank you. Um, you said, Greg, that um, you think that the increase in jobs is due to the spate of business tax rate decreases. Um, do you have data you can share with us to support that thought? Thank you for the question, Senator. I, uh, I said in, uh, that in part with, as with a number of other policies. And I, and I think that the, um, that the ability to disaggregate uh, all those data, uh, th there's a degree of sensitivity. Uh, trust me, I've actually reached out to not one, but two economists. And trust me, I've been looking to pay for a study to show just that. <laughs> trust me, I want to know that quest the answer to that question as much as anybody. And I've uh, come across uh, several several uh, economists who, who talked about the variability and the sensitivity. And, and again, I'm, I, these are people I'm looking to pay money to <laughs> and they didn't take the work. So, so if you find an economist who'd be uh, willing to, to take on that task, uh, I'd be very interested in talking to them. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Ava. All right, Mr. Chair. So we have a few hands raised. We have members of the DRA. So two folks have their hands raised. I know that three folks wanted to speak together at once to the bill. Um, Drew Klein also has their hand raised. So how would you like to proceed? Uh, let's go ahead and start with DRA. Let's start with DRA. Are you there, Senator? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, let's go ahead and start with the DRA, if that's okay. Super. I am bringing them in now. The reason for that is I think they'll bring in information that may be of benefit to the others who are looking to participate in the discussion as well, so. Great, can you hear me all right? Yep. Sure. Chair recognizes uh, Melissa Rollins from the Department of Revenue Administration and her team. Welcome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Melissa Rollins, Senior Financial Analyst at the Department of Revenue. And with me on the line is Carolyn Lear, uh, Assistant Commissioner for the Department of Revenue. We will speak specifically to the fiscal impact of part one of this bill, reducing the business profits tax and business enterprise tax rates. So as you heard, this bill reduces the business profits tax rate from 7.7 .7 to 7.6 and the BEP from 0.6 to 0.55% for taxable periods ending December 31st, 2021. And then there's a further reduction in de December 31st, 2022. Determining the fiscal impact, we do a static analysis on this impact. And our starting point for this was fiscal year 20 cash basis plus the anomalous revenue um, of the 18.3 million, which you've heard us talk about in a couple of presentations. And that brought us starting point to 697.5 million for both taxes. I'll talk about them in terms of both taxes. However, when we do do the analysis, it is separated between BET and BPT. Okay. So that's our starting point. And obviously if that starting point does vary as we end in fiscal year 21, whether it's higher than that, 
point, the fiscal analysis will change some, but when we did this fiscal analysis, we weren't sure if we were going to meet fiscal year 21 plan. As you know, it was, you know, the end of November, beginning of December. So at that point, that seemed like the appropriate starting point. We then needed to reduce it slightly more by about $6 million to account for prior rate reductions that had nothing to do with this bill. And that got us to a starting point of $691.5 million. After that point, as we've talked about in the past, tax year spanned, multiple tax years spanned one fiscal year. And if you have either our fiscal note quick guide, which I believe we distributed, as well as the um, fiscal note attached to the bill, you can see that in the proposed legislation rates and splits chart. We break right, out- Melissa, the Melissa sure. if you hold for just a minute, I wanna make sure the members of the committee have that information. Sure. Do we have that available? All right, thank you. Proceed. Perfect. So, so there's a one of the charts, the first chart has current rate laws and, and splits and that shows where we're at today. And then the next longer chart has proposed legislation rates and splits. And again, that shows how multiple tax years cross one fiscal year. So it gets a little bit tricky. It's not just one rate crosses one fiscal year. They're kind of divvied up and that's based on a historical analysis of the um, of revenues. So taking the base that we talked about, splitting that amongst the fiscal year or, or taking the starting revenue, splitting that amongst the fiscal years to get the base. We then take the base, divide it by the new rates or multiply by the new rates over the fiscal years to get the impact. And that's shown in the next chart that you have. And we have it broken down by year over year as well as cumulative impact. So for fiscal year 21, our estimated impact is 5.9 million with an ending full impact impact in fiscal year 24, which will have the full rates taken into effect at that point is 53.7 million. Happy to answer any questions. Are there questions from members of the committee? Senator Hennessy. Thank you. And thank you very much for my, taking my question. Um, just looking at 2024, can you explain to us um, why there would be a drop from about 22 to 22 or 20 million to 4 million? Is it just because of growth and projected revenues? It's actually because at that point, if you look at the chart, um, the chart that has the rates in it, the proposed legislation rates and splits, when you're looking at the last box in that chart, fiscal year 24 is the last point that will feel that last third and fourth quarter um, estimate payments, as well as tax payments. So we're only feeling the last portion of the rate changes in fiscal year 24. The bulk is felt in 23, and then there's some residual to get to 24, which is the last Thanks. 4 million. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions, I believe uh, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I just had a quick question. Um, if if New Hampshire had not been subjecting the PPP loans to the BPT, would we have hit the trigger that was in House Bill 3 on the rates? Uh, that's a good question, Senator Rosenwald. Mm. So it's hard to determine what portion, we've been looking at the PPP information and it's hard to determine what portion of taxpayers and what amounts they were using to supplement, supplement their payments during that time. So to hit the trigger, that would have been the first and second quarter estimate payments for calendar year filers. Um, I imagine some portion of them adjusted their estimate payments to include that PPP information. However, I don't, we don't have any idea of how much was supplemented in there. Um, so that's a hard question to answer whether it was yes or not, yes or no. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Church. You're very welcome. Further questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll see you again and again. Yes, thank you. Okay, Mr. Chair, next we have Drew Klein. Hi there, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you so much for having me and for allowing uh, members of the public to speak on this legislation. Welcome. I'm Drew, uh, 
Thanks. I'm Drew Klein. I'm president of the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. I just came to give you a little context, just neutral on the bill. Um, <clears throat> and this is something we've looked at um, over the last few years and, and just wanted to make you aware of it. So you just heard from DRA about the revenue effects. <clears throat> um, and the DRA's analysis is very good, but it's static. So it doesn't take into account how business tax rate changes might affect behavior in the business community. So if you reduce a business's tax rate, you are in effect um, reducing a business expense. That business then has more cash on hand to use at its discretion. And um, <clears throat> there are some mixed studies on the effects of this, but the uh, large majority suggests that when you lower corporate tax rates, you do get a stimulative effect on the economy. You do change business behavior. And so I wanted to th put this in context of the last few years of the state budget. Going back to 2015, when we had the debate over the um, tax rate reductions that we're looking at now over the last few years. So in 2015, Governor Hassan predicted that the business tax rate cuts <clears throat> that were put into place by the legislature and would start in the 2016 fiscal year would blow a $90 million hole in the upcoming budget. In fact, <clears throat> business tax revenues were 132.8 million or 23% above plan in fiscal year 2016 and 72.7 million or 13% above plan in fiscal year 2017. That trend continued for the next two years. Business tax revenues were 118.8 million or 18% above plan in fiscal year 2018 and 151.6 million or 23% above plan in fiscal year 2019. So in those four years after the prediction that business tax rate cuts would blow $90 million hole in the budget, business tax revenues exceeded budget projections by a combined $475.6 million. That is almost half a billion dollars in additional unplanned business tax revenue. What about the four years before? A lot of people attribute that purely to the national economy, which began to take off after 2009. Well, if you go back to the four years before, we'll start in fiscal year 2012. That year, business tax revenues were 13.1 million above plan, they were 33.7 million above plan in 2013. They were 11.5 million below plan in 2014 and 6.5 million below plan in 2015. Excuse me, so after the business tax rate cuts took effect, business tax rate uh, revenues for the state exploded. Now, I'm not saying that the business tax cuts caused all of that. Um, we all know that there was national economic growth. There were federal tax changes that were involved in that. And we haven't done the in-depth analysis to um, parse all of that out. But you can get a sense of how New Hampshire was affected versus the national economy by looking at GDP growth of both. So if you start 2016 to 2019, those four years, U.S. GDP grew by 9.3%, according to Federal Reserve data, New Hampshire's GDP grew by 11.6%. So we had almost 2.5% GDP growth higher than the U.S. average in those four years. So something we were doing in New Hampshire was working to accelerate our economy faster than the national rate of growth. And I think there's pretty clear or strong evidence that those business tax rate reductions were playing a strong role in that. So that is my testimony. I just wanted to make you aware of, of the historical effect of cutting the business tax rates in New Hampshire in the last few years. Thank you very much, Drew. Any questions from the members of the committee? No, it, it, just Senator D'Alessandro, you're uh, recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a, a comment, at, at the same time, there were, there were enormous changes at the federal level. There was repatriation, which uh, had a tremendous effect on, on our business taxes. Uh, so there were there were events that took place outside of the state of New Hampshire that have a very that had a very positive effect on, on our, our income. So when you gauge all of these numbers, you, you've you've really got to look at what was happening at a national level, the the tax law changes that took place that had a dramatic impact, 
the repatriation, which which took place, and all of these had all of these had positive effects on, on the business climate. Yeah, absolutely, and Senator, I, I agree with that entirely, and we point that out. And um, we, but I think if again, if you look at the GDP growth rate of the U.S. versus New Hampshire, um, we clearly were growing at a faster rate in that time, and. So again, I think you can accredit some of our additional growth and some of our, that economic activity to those business rate reductions. And, um, and so that was, that was our point. Not that it was all attributed to that, but there was a factor there. And, um, and again, you know, just having those rates reduced, leaving more money in the pockets of businesses, um, as uh, Mr. Moore testified a mo few moments ago, um, we did see a, a big hiring boom uh, along with that economic growth, we had a lot of hiring in New Hampshire and additional population growth. And um, I think you can probably attribute um, quite a large fraction of that to the fact that businesses had more money at their discretion to hire. If, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, those are, those are good comments. I agree with those. But remember, at the same time, we reduced the business profits tax from 8.5% to 7.9 to 7.7, we reduced the business enterprise tax. And when and when you look at, as a Representative Alby pointed out, I look at it as a pyramid. She says it's a triangle. The big hitters did extremely well, did extremely well. And the percentage of people who don't file and don't pay remains at 50%. So it was it was the major concerns who were who were uh, getting positive results from from the decrease in, in in the tax and i think they're they're very satisfied with the rate that exists today um if i if i could just quickly respond i don't want to have a you know <laughs> conversation but um in new hampshire i don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head but um small businesses um account for about i think it's about 50 percent of employment in new hampshire large businesses are about 50 percent as well so um if you want to keep in mind that uh, the Federal Reserve has done a study on this, and I can, um, if it's okay with the chair, I can uh, send a link to this study to all the members if you want to take a look at it. Um, two years ago, Federal Reserve Bank did a study of corporate tax rates and their effect on um, hiring and entrepreneurship. And, and they found that lowering um, corporate tax rates uh, actually stimulated small business entrepreneurship. It had a, a pretty strong effect on smaller businesses. So it, it is not the case that it only affects or mostly um, benefits large businesses. There is a, a really strong impact on small businesses. So I can send that along for the members of the committee. Would you please? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Drew. Um, my question is specific to the Education Trust Fund asking you to put your other hat on. Okay. Um, <laughs> given the uh, fiscal note shows uh, about, oh, over $75 million revenue decrease in the next budget from lowering these two taxes. And um, given that the Education Trust Fund is kind of underwater now and requires uh, transfers from the general fund. Do you have any concern about further drawing down the amount of money that goes to the Education Trust Fund? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I would just, again, refer to my comments from before to point out that the fiscal note was done on a static analysis, so it doesn't take into account how business behavior changes. And so I just simply think that that analysis is incorrect, that you're not going to lose that, that amount of revenue, that if further reductions in these rates would um, possibly stimulate new revenue. But uh, I don't think the loss would be anywhere um, near that. I think it likely to see an increase in revenue due to the stimulating uh, effect on the economy. Oh, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions from the members of the committee? Hearing none, uh, thank you very much, Drew. Sure. All right, Mr. Chair. So at this time, we have just one more hand that had raised during uh, Mr. Klein's testimony, which is Representative Horrigan. I'm assuming speaking to part one as we're still on part one. So I'll bring him in. Representative Horrigan, you're recognized. 
Um, thank you very much. I'll try to be brief, and I hope I don't duplicate too much. I, I hopped in while uh, Mr. Klein from the Josiah Bartlett Center, and certainly um, he's, of course, predictably in favor of any tax cuts, and um, well, we're all in favor of tax cuts. Um, first of all, I think increases in revenue that we've seen since the tax cuts probably have very little to do with the tax cuts per se. I mean, we do have a healthy economic climate and, um, you know, but uh, we're, we're, we're far below, we're far below the point of diminishing returns for these uh, taxes, especially with business profits tax. Um, you'd have to raise it very, high, very, very high before businesses would stop trying to make a profit. So, um, and um, so I think, you know, the, so even increases we had a few years ago were fairly small and then this bill is rolling back a trigger that was put in, um, I think, three budget cycles ago in 2015, where um, they were assuming sort of a supply side tax cut, um, you know, like, and um, so if, if the economy basically shrank by more than 6%, then this trigger would go in just to make it make up for the revenue shortfall so the government could get a little more, more revenue to keep operating. And I remember I had a little exchange with Neil Kirk at a uh, budget briefing, and I pretend to be really amazed. I'm tried to pretend that I thought it was a typo that it looks like the rate could actually go up under certain circumstances. And how could that be? And he, um, he played along with me um, and he, and um, he, he pointed out and uh, he wasn't wrong that this was virtually impossible. The economy could shrink that much, um, even, you know, even without all the wonderful things like the tax cuts that we're doing with the economy, that that never happened. And of course, then, in 2020, lots of things that are virtually impossible happened, including the economy. I think it, including the economy shrinking by uh, you know, close to six percent. Um, you know, we so, and that was when these things kicked in, and that was when it became an issue in the campaign. So, um, so I'm certainly, uh, I mean, I certainly could vote for a budget that has this in here. Um, we'll get the House budget, which is probably the first step, um, but in implementing this, but uh, it's going to have no stimulative effect whatsoever, in my opinion. I don't think this makes, I don't think, especially these are just fractions of a percentage point. So I think businesses uh, don't change their business plans based on such small uh, changes to the tax, to taxes. And also, uh, especially the business enterprise tax. Uh, I mean, I'm surprised it's in there because it is effectively an income tax and we don't like income taxes here in New Hampshire, but I guess it's not broad based because it only covers certain types of enterprises, you know, and then um, also it's paid by the employer rather than employees. I guess it's kind of not really an income tax, even though it basically has the same effect, but you, you could actually cut that all the way to zero and you would only be reducing it by six tenths of a percentage point. I think even that is not going to change even that I think is going to have no stimulative effect whatsoever. So this is, uh, you know, this the static analysis, I bet is pretty, probably pretty close to correct. That that's pretty much how much revenue we'd lose. There'd be like only a minimal stimulative effect. So I just be, I'm just going to be contrarian and say, uh, this, you know, this is just, this is just a waste of time. It's going to make a no change. It's going to really like, uh, it's going to have no stimulus effect whatsoever. So that's, uh, you know, we can, um, we can pass this if you want to. It's certainly, Certainly makes everyone feel good, including me. So I don't like paying taxes more than anybody else. And of course, I'd love to pay the business profits tax. I wish I could make a profit in my business, but enough to make the pay the business profits tax. But it's, uh, it's, um, it's, you know, it's it's basically just a feel good feel good measure. So it's not really going to help the revenue situation. All certainly, it's not going to create so much business growth. They're going to have an actual increase in revenue just because of uh, the business tax cuts. That would. Um, the numbers just don't work. It's an it's a fantasy. But anyway, so so that's my two cents. Um, you know, and I'm I'm in the house, so I mean we have a similar measure in the house. So like you know, I will be a while. I may never be a while before I even uh, before this omnibus bill comes across the proverbial wall. Um, uh, and we look at it. So and thanks for your time. So thank you, Representative. If anybody wants to ask any questions? I can try to answer. But um, are there any questions for Representative Horrigan? Basically, it's just a feel-good bill. It's not going to really... Uh, hearing people. none, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Mr. Chair, at this time, I see no additional hands raised for part one. So if anyone was intending to testify to part one, this would be the time, this would be the time to virtually raise your hand or dial star nine if you were calling in via the phone. 
And I see no hands raised, Mr. Chair, for part one. Thank you, uh, Ava. Let's move on then to part two. Super. So again, if you are interested in testifying to part two of the bill, please virtually raise your hand at this time. Okay, we have Devin Rodrigue from the DRA. All right. And Carolyn Lear from the DRA, I apologize. Okay, um, who wants to go for DRA? Hello, this is Devin Roderick, Department of Revenue. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Devin, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm joined here by Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, the proposed legislation increases the interest and dividends tax exemptions for tax years ending on or after December 31st, 2021. Um, in the interest of time, um, we don't, you know, we'll opt to not go through our entire fiscal note if that's right with you, but we are available to answer questions if you'd like to. Okay, are there any questions for uh, Mr. Rodrigue or uh, Mrs. Lear uh, from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. No problem, like I said, we're available to answer any questions if anything arises, thank you. And I'm sure there will be some at some point. Thank you very much. Okay, again, if anyone is interested in testifying on part two of this bill, this would be the time to raise your hand virtually. And Mr. Chair, there is no hands raised at this time. Very well. Uh, we'll move on then to part three of the bill. Part three, please raise your hand at this time if you're interested in testifying to part three of this bill. You can do so through the Zoom application or by dialing star nine via the phone. Okay, so Carolyn Lear of DRA, with DRA. Okay, Carolyn, you're recognized to speak. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Carolyn Lear from the Department of Revenue. Um, I was actually asked to be available for questions by Senator Gray. Um, I don't know if he's still on and had questions for us, but if not, then I do not need to testify on this section. Um, Mr. Chair, I do not see Senator Gray currently under attendees. Okay. Okay, but well, you know how to reach us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Okay, so next we have Tom Cronin for part three of the bill. Mr. Cronin, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Tom Cronin, uh, Director of Government Relations for the University System. Um, I'm here this morning on behalf of USNH as well as our colleagues at the Community College System. We had sent a letter over from our leadership um, with a request on this bill uh, simply uh, our request would be if you're going to move forward uh, with part three as written, uh, that you please consider an exemption from that part for the institutions within CCSNH and USNH, uh, quite simply uh, as state uh, component units. Uh, we are without question exempt, exempt from uh, local taxes. Um, and, and simply this would just prevent some additional uh, record keeping and reporting on our part um, for a, a pretty well accepted fact on that piece. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if there are any, or certainly could follow up later on if anything emerges. So any questions for members of the committee? Hearing none, I do have a question. Uh, would uh, the, uh, if you will, the university system be averse to a one-time inventory and thence after to be excused? Uh, I don't no, I certainly don't think so. I mean, certainly, uh, particularly with the University of New Hampshire, and I think others as well. I mean, properties do come on and off our books through gifts and otherwise. So it does, we do sort of change from time to time. But I'm certainly, I mean, we obviously have that information and would be happy to share it either with the committee or otherwise um, at any time. Okay, I, I would, I would like to see that. Um... Uh, that, you know, I'd like to see a one-time inventory to start with, and then we can go from there. Because this, the, the impact of uh, state-owned properties, whether it be university system or other, on small town budgets, uh, for example, Plymouth, uh, and, and the property tax and so forth, despite the, um, the payment in lieu of taxes, or I think they have a different name for it up in Plymouth sure. uh, Services. Uh, I think it's an impact, it's a figure, it's, it's, it's a 
a quantification that will be helpful as we're dealing with issues like local property taxes that are that are getting uh, significant uh, significantly and, and unbearable in some cases. So uh, I'd appreciate that, um, and can I'll defer to the will of the committee, um, uh, and we'll see where this bill goes. Any further questions from the committee? Okay, just one, but what's one, Mr. Chairman? Senator D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Cronin, yes, when, when, when a property is ceded uh, to the institution, what do, when is the decision made as to whether or not uh, this this uh, property is taxed or, or, or not taxed? Uh, of course. So for, for example, when a home is given to the, or when Rosebud Farm was given to the university, when these uh, large bequeaths from uh, entities, when, when it, how is that handled and when is it handled? As it really affects the local tax rate, obviously. Of course, thanks, Senator. Um, uh, as, you, as you all well know, our board of trustees is uh, obviously uh, comprised a number of state officials, um, a few from each of the, the uh, institutions. I believe that's similar to how the community college system has set up their board. Essentially, the boards will look at those properties when they come online, um, determine if they fit the educational mission um, and if they're then going to be used as, you know, property towards that mission, they would become tax exempt. Uh, if we look at those properties and find that either they cannot or they do not fit that mission, um, we would essentially sell that property um, and have it come off of our books. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Most welcome. Further questions? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. Cronin, for your testimony. Thanks, Senator. I'll get you that information as soon as I can. All right, Mr. Chair, next we have Joe Lassard. You should be all set. Okay, Mr. Lassard, welcome. They are unmuted on, on my end here. Um, we'll give them a moment or two, perhaps. Okay. Mr. Well, we Lassard, can... can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Okay, you're recognized, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Joe Lassard. I'm one of the original founders and, and an current employee of Municipal Resources, um, which provides assessing services among other municipal services to a number of communities in the state, and currently a member of the Assessing Standards Board. Um, However, I am speaking for myself. I believe that you had some written uh, testimony from the chairman of the Assessing Standards Board, Betty, Betsy Patton. I'm not sure if she's going to be speaking today or not, but I just wanted to say that, that uh, including uh, educational associations along with the current um, charitable organizations, helps us assessors to better determine the appropriateness of uh, an exemption, uh, which as you know, um, any exemption shifts taxes to the other taxpayers, um, incre increasing their portion of, of what the taxes might otherwise be if, if there weren't uh, exempt organizations. Um, and I have to say, I apologize. I'm not sure if I said that, but I'm speaking for myself and not as the ASB, um, but I'd be glad to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? Hearing none, I do have a question, Ms. Lassard. Can you help explain how this will help you and the ASB in the performance of your work? Um, well, one of the things as, um, Senator Gray indicated was that if we have questions about um, finances, if you will, um, then we have to, you know, ask additional information and and obviously require the organization to um, to then respond to certain requests. Um, but it's certainly appropriate for us to know um, how their income and expenses are applied um, in determining whether or not they meet the requirement 
for the exemption. Okay. Further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, at this time, I see no further hand ra hands raised for part three. So if anyone is interested in testifying on part three of the bill, this would be the time to raise your hand virtually. And Mr. Chair, it looks like there are no hands raised at this time. Thank you very much. We'll proceed on to section four. Okay. Any folks who are interested in testifying to part four, please virtually raise your hand now. All right, we have Lindsay Courtney. Okay, Director, welcome to the committee. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Courtney. I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Office of Professional Licensure and Certification, the agency that oversees the administration of the 54 licensing boards within the state of New Hampshire. SB 13 part four is intended to clarify the agency's authority regarding its ability to establish fees across the agency. These changes are vital to ensure the agency's ability to, to function effectively. Accordingly, I ask your support of this portion of the bill. The agency already has the statu statutory authority to establish fees. Effective July 1, 2019, RSA 310A granted to the executive director the authority to establish by rule all fees authorized by statute for all boards, commissions, and councils within the office. However, approximately half of the practice acts within our agency have language that conflict with this statutory authority. Such practice acts either grant the boards the authority to adopt fees by statute or explicitly establish fees. As you know, traditional rules of statutory construction dictate that to the extent there are two statutory provisions that conflict, the last statute that is amended controls. So as practice acts have been amended after RSA 310A and continue to grant boards the authority to promulgate fees, the boards and not the agency have the ability to set fees. Um, SB 13 intends to remedy this conflict by removing all references in the Practice Acts to fees, including those set by legislation. Given the current conflicts in statute, the agency has not been able to promulgate fees for boards within the agency. Because boards share services, when one board's fees are changed, the expense and revenue ratios for the other boards are altered. Essentially, OPLC as an agency has to conduct fee setting for all boards at the same time to ensure an equitable allocation of expenses. While the proposed fiscal impact statement notes that the agency determined there would be no fiscal impact, I wish to clarify that the agency noted that the fiscal impact was indeterminable. The agency plans to conduct rulemaking to adjust fees to ensure that its fees and revenues do not exceed 125% of its expenses. The need for changes to fees will depend in part, of course, on the OPLC's budget for FY22 and 23. I wish to um, answer some questions that were raised earlier um, in response to Senator Gaida's introduction. Um, there, is, there is a potential that fees could be raised. There is also a huge potential that fees could be decreased. There are boards right now that are paying well in advance of what they should be when we consider the 125% mark. There are also boards that are not paying enough um, and the agency really needs to get a handle on that in terms of um, rulemaking and ensuring an equitable allocation, but we have to do that at the same time. By granting the agency the authority or making it clear that the agency has the authority to adopt fees, it certainly is going to simplify the process. Right now we have I would say nearly 400 different types of fees. All of our fees are, um, all of the checks and the fees are run through finance, which is uh, we have five people in finance responsible for really managing 400 different types of fees. As you can imagine, that's really inefficient and um, there's obviously room for error when that happens. So we really need to simplify it as we're going through the rulemaking process. Um, again, I think there are going to be legislative checks on the agency's authority. Obviously, rules have to be promulgated and go through jail car. Um, and right now, there's there's obviously the, the issue with uh, the agency not really being able to set fees at all and the boards still lacking that authority. 
So in short, I, you know, the general court in, intended to grant the agency a, the authority to establish all fees when it amended RSA 310A in 2019. Consistent with this, SB 13 Part 4 clarifies the agency's authority by removing conflicting statutory provisions from the Board Practice Acts. OPLC fully supports this portion of the bill. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide comments and for Senator Gaida for sponsoring um, this portion of the legislation. I'd be happy to answer any questions should you have any. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember this bill from last year. And there was an issue that had to do with the amount of money that was going to otherwise lapse from pharmacy licensing. But I think it's a broader issue and Representative Almy uh, alluded to it. Will this bill change the amount of money um, that OPLC might or might not lapse by giving more centralized control Good. Um, so effective with HB4, um, with the last budget cycle, uh, the legislation changed our statute from a non-lapsing dedicated fund to a lapsing dedicated fund, actually at the end of every fiscal year, which is a little bit difficult for us to budget because we take in fees essentially on a biennial basis. Um, by granting us the authority to promulgate fees across the board, it obviously could reduce the amount of revenue that we're taking in, thereby impacting our laps, but it won't necessarily change, you know, it, it doesn't change the authority or the requirement that we lapse funds to the general fund, unfortunately. Thank you. Further questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much, uh, Director Courtney, for your testimony and for, in my opinion, the excellent job you're doing in consolidating, amalgamating, and efficiency sizing, if you will, the OPLC. Thank you, Senator. Okay, Mr. Chair, at this time, I see no additional hands raised for part- and That would be for any of the bills, for any for of the parts of the bill. Right. For part four, um, the only other individual we had signed up to speak who is no longer in the attendees list and did not raise their hand for any part of the bill um, is Betsy Patton. Um, so if she is here and would like to testify, this would be the opportunity to do so. And I do not see their hand. Okay, Betsy Patton is the chair of the um, Assessing Standards Board. So, okay. Any further testimony at all? I do not see any folks raising their hand at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 13. And with the indulgence of the committee members, I'd like to take five minutes uh, break, stretch, and get back so we can get on to Senate Bill 101. So we'll recess until uh, 1037. <clears throat> okay, guys.
Right on time. We're here. Right on time. <sighs> All right. All members of the committee are back. We'll go back into session and... Um, we will take up Senate Bill 101. Chair will recognize the sponsor, if available. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can Good morning, Senator Susi. Good morning, sorry. Try to run to Two laptops at the same time while taking text messages. We're all multitasking these days. So <laughs> good morning. I'm Donna Susi. I represent Senate District 18, and I'm here to present to you Senate Bill 101, increasing the minimum gross business income required for filing a business profits tax return. Um, the bill makes a very simple change. What it does is increases the threshold by which someone needs to file their BPT return. That's business profits tax only. This has nothing to do with the business enterprise tax. Um, this legislation might look familiar to those of you that were in the Senate before. Uh, this legislation was passed unanimously on a roll call vote this past year. Uh, the legislation essentially takes a burden off of a number of our small businesses um, at a time when many of them are struggling. Uh, you'll see from the fiscal note, obviously it's unclear um, exactly how many businesses will be impacted, but we know it will be several, at least several hundred uh, that won't have to make these filings. Um, it will, once again, as I said, ease the burden for them without a significant impact to revenue and I think just makes good sense, particularly in these times. So I would ask the committee for your support for this legislation. Um, and as I said, for those of you that were around last session, once again, and I'd be happy to take any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Susie. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next, Mr. Chair, we have Representative Almy. Representative Almy, you recognized. Thank you. I don't know how you get so few people who want to testify in your committee. I wish we had that. Um, I want, I just want to support this bill. I don't think we didn't see it at all last term. I'm not sure what you did with it in the end, but this bill is an efficient and effective way to relieve business taxpayers who owe small amounts. Oh, do I, I need to introduce myself again. Sorry. I'm help. starting. Yes. Uh, Representative Susan Almy on City of Lebanon, Granite, uh, Granite, <laughs> Grafton on 13. On I was chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the House last term, and I am still on it. On um, for me, this bill is an efficient and effective way to relieve business taxpayers who owe small amounts of BPT of a large amount of administrative expense, as well as their small contribution to state revenues, which may not be that small for them. One group it should eliminate is the independent proprietors and small partnerships whose net profits are dwarfed by their expenditures on equipment and supplies. Uh, the $50,000 floor is gross uh, revenue. It is not revenue minus expenses. Um, it, one group it should eliminate is, oh, I just did that one. I, I'm thinking in terms of snow plowers, small auto repair shops, and manufacturing startups on, that are saddled with this administrative expense now and a little bit maybe of revenues or they are just having to file and not paying. Uh, the floor for filing BPT was raised from $12,000 to $50,000 for, 
for tax year 94, 1994. The inflation rate since then has been a little under 75%. I do not have the number of businesses uh, an increase of the floor to 75,000 would affect, but I suggest that you ask DRA, perhaps Rep, uh, Senator Sissy has already done that. Uh, and that's the answer she got. Uh, my worry with this uh, is if an unreasonable number, uh, unreasonable in quotes, number of businesses are exempted by this from the BPT, we could be faced with a constitutional lawsuit similar to the one that governor, pre-governor Benson uh, did that led to the creation of the BET in 1993. The idea was that there were uh, the large businesses on, were paying too much of the business tax and, the, and nobody else was paying it. In 2015, we passed a biennial CPI urban Northeast adjustment to the BET floor, the business enterprise tax floor to avoid the shock to the revenue system of adjusting the floor all at once. At that time, there would, had been quite a lot of inflation. Uh, and um, it does seem to be working now. I just wanted to bring that to you for consideration. Uh, the DRA estimates that this bill would have cost 1.5 million in the banner FY18 year when the result of the, F, of the 2017 federal tax reform came in. It might cost a little bit more than that this year and until we have a full recovery because less profitable businesses have suffered worse in general from the pandemic. And if they are still paying BPT would fall below the floor. Uh, but that little might be enough to help them survive and to grow. They're our most fragile businesses at this point. The big businesses are making out like bandits. <laughs> which is good for our revenues. Thank you very much. That was all I needed to say. Thank you, Senator Almey. Are there any questions? I'm sorry, Representative Almey, are there any questions? <laughs> Senator Daniels. Thank you. Re Representative Almey, currently the BET is a credit against the BPT. Do you know statutorily, uh, do, does the statute uh, say that, that people will pay the BET until 50,000 or does, does it say to the threshold of the BET, a BPT? The, the statute for the BPT, business profits tax, says that you have to file when you hit 50,000 in profits, uh, not net profits, gross profits. The, the statute for the BET uh, says that I think we took it up to 75,000 on um, that you have to file if you're on, um, I have never quite understood the components of the uh, business enterprise tax floor. And I don't know if DRA is going to want to explain them now. I'd love to have them do it. Uh, but on um, of that one. So their floor is different than the BPT floor. And it would continue different because they're looking at different items. Um, but um, it, so if you do pay, if you do qualify to have to file for the BPT, um, and you didn't have to qualify somehow for paying for the BET, you still have to, I think you would not have to file the paperwork for the BET, but you would have to file for the BPT. And what the BT, BPT taxes is the excess above what you already paid for the BET. So if you didn't qualify for the BET, I think DRA could tell me, but you would, you would file you would have to file both actually, because you'd end up having to pay the BET and then the surplus. Follow up, Senator Daniels. Yes, let me rephrase the question. If, if this bill were to pass, would people pay the BET 
up to seventy five thousand. On it's not the the tax rate is not on the seventy five thousand itself, as I understand it. But that is a section of the BET law that I have never quite understood, and I hope that the DRA will explain it for both of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone from the DRA that would be willing to comment on that question? So, Mr. Chair, um, Devin Rodrigue from the DRA has his hand raised. Great. Thank you, Devin, you're recognized. And unmute. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, Chairman, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Devin Roderick. I'm a financial analyst in the Hampshire Department of Revenue. Also join me is uh, Carolyn Leo, the assistant commissioner. As soon as Susie explained earlier, the proposed legislation increases the BPT threshold from in excess of 50,000 to in excess of 75,000. To clarify a couple of points um, already discussed, this bill would have an effect on the uh, on 4,664 taxpayers mm. based on tax year 2019 data. So of those who, who filed business profits tax returns within the New Hampshire Department of Revenue in tax year 2019, um, based on these changes, we compared those taxpayers with some federal data and uh, 4,664 would be affected by that threshold increase. When you look at those, those 4,664, 4,004 had no BPT liability during that tax year, while 660 did report a BPT liability in total altogether of 1.5 million, which is the fiscal impact of the bill. Uh, when you look at the, the population, that 660 population, um, their BPT ranged in, uh, in, in liability from $1 up to 33,075. So that, that, that gives you a better idea of the population based on tax year 2019, uh, 2018, excuse me, of this bill. So also to get into the, 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 the bet filing threshold a little bit, um, <clears throat> the commissioner uh, based on house in 2015, based on house bill 187, the commissioner shall, shall biennially adjust the bet filing threshold amounts rounding to the nearest 1000 based on the two year um, percentage change in the consumer price index. So for the latest change, which was published January 1st, 2021, the filing threshold for business enterprise taxpayers was for gross business receipts in excess of 222,000 or an enterprise value tax base greater than 111,000. So to further clarify, do you have any questions at this point on that information? Questions from the committee? Okay, Senator Daniels, uh, has your uh, concern been addressed? Yes, from all side, thank you. Thank you. All right, hearing none, thank you, Devin. You're welcome. So before I put them back in the attendees list, I know that they had both signed up to testify um, to this bill. Was that, was that, is that sufficient as their testimony or should I keep them in? Well, let's find out. <laughs> that pretty much, yeah, that, that pretty much, um, includes everything that we really needed to say unless there are any other questions. Okay. Hearing no further questions. Thanks again. <clears throat> Super. So Mr. Chair, at this time, I have no one else signed up to speak. So if any of the attendees at this point would like to testify on this bill, they would need to virtually raise their hand or dial star nine. Uh, yeah, we'll wait about oh, 15 or 20 seconds. And I do not see any hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I would move to uh, adjourn the meeting um, and would take a motion for that. So moved. Second. Moved by Senator D'Alessandro, seconded by Daniels. Roll call, all in favor. Um, Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator D'Alessandro? Yes. And Senator Gaida, 
Votes yes. Uh, parting comment, thank you so much to our staff that continues to make this all possible. Uh, and They're tolerates, great. They're uh, great. They have a tolerates gets a our sometimes inept and comical attempts to make it all work. Thank you so very much for all that you do. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everybody.